This podcast is sponsored by Biomedis Trinity. Biomedis Trinity is an advanced and effective wellness product which makes use of multi-frequency bioresonance technology. Biomedis Trinity enhances existing bodily functions and systems from nervous, circulatory, respiratory, digestive, reproductive, excretory, endocrine, musculoskeletal, lymphatic and immune system, helping to improve the working capacity of organs and helping to prevent premature aging and support a natural balance. The device's antiparasitic and purifying functions aid in the removal of waste and toxic substances from the body, such as heavy metals, chemicals, graphene oxide, EMF, viruses, bacteria, parasites, mold, and much more. Our frequencies of the body constantly change their values, therefore Trinity constantly adapts to these changes and maintains an adequate frequency of influence. Due to this, the corrective frequencies penetrate the body without hindrance and more efficiently. These natural frequencies are packed into a unique device with a stylish, reliable, compact and lightweight. Biomedis Trinity is easy to take with you wherever you go and enables you to influence and support your own health. Use the link on the screen and use my code LEAN10 for 10% off. Hello and welcome to the Love, Peace, Truth, Karma podcast. I'm your host, Leanne Brown, and today I've got the very beautiful, very inspirational Stephanie Ward with me. She is a psychotherapist and she specializes in childhood trauma. We talk about everything from masculine, feminine energy, childhood trauma, of course, and even the Amber and Johnny Depp case. You don't want to miss this podcast. Enjoy. If you're in China, you just know it's corrupt. They want it. They want it to be like that here. People are pretending to be twelve-year-old kids, mate, and they're not. Yeah. They're forty-year-old men. Now we're getting bombarded with all these death numbers, but there's no context there. He'd got one child pregnant. He'd raped many others, and we had evidence to prove that. Do you think evil still exists today as it did back then? And the answer should very simply be yes. Stephanie, thank you for coming and joining me on the podcast today. Oh, I'm so glad I'm here. We've been talking about it for ages and I'm finally here. So it's, Pinning you, it's like everyone, I'm like, pin them down, get them yeah. to come on. So you are a psychotherapist and, um, you know, when we had a, we sat down and we had a really good chat, you know, our daughters both go to conscious class, classrooms, which yeah. I'm so grateful of. I'm actually today at a sound bath in the the, the Luna, what's she, what's she called? Luna something or other, where they yeah. go in the little hanging pods it looks amazing I don't know how they didn't invite us to be honest exactly (laughs) Exactly. we are raising conscious children you know they're aware of their emotions able to identify how they're feeling it's it's huge you know my relationship with Sky since she's been at that school is just it's been so much deeper there's more substance there I know what's going on in her mind and she's aware of her feelings and her body and I'm sure it's the same for Lola. Yeah, definitely. It's just so beautiful to to have them to have them opportunities to do them things, you know, whereas obviously, like I said to Lola on the way here, are you excited? You're going to be going to a sound bath today. You know, imagine if you were yeah. at normal school where you are going sitting in a classroom and in, in a desk all day, you know, doing I things that you're probably never going to use with the, in the future anyways. I couldn't imagine putting Sky back into a mainstream no. school now, especially with everything that's going, going on. on. Even us being at school years ago, I was so defined by my education. It's a huge thing for me, but that was part of my conditioning that I had to relax and and sort of release because I felt so tied into that rat race of make money, have money. You know, it became sort of an authority to me, whereas with Sky, she doesn't have that. She's more creative and really trying to help her develop things that she's good at and that she enjoys rather than things that make money yeah that's it like trying to fit them in a box of uh what the system wants them to to um base their abilities on Uh, they say like you you teach her try and teach her fish how to climb a tree it'll spend its whole life thinking it's stupid and it's just so true isn't it and there's so much in children they're just there's so many different levels to them and and yeah so I'm just so grateful that I've we've been able to see that and we will talk a bit more yeah. about uh the awakening and, and <laughs> uh obviously with the bills and everything yeah. like I just mentioned to you like and your experience with that but first let's delve into um your past um we both my now ex-partner as well are both um footballers or of ex-footballers yeah. um professional footballers and um 
yeah, just our experiences with that and how it's affected us, um, our relationship with them. Um, Seems like a lifetime ago, honestly. I feel like a different person from who was in that relationship and I have so much empathy for that for that girl for that little girl because she was a little girl I, I was my, in my early 20s I didn't know what was going on and similar to what you've just said Leanne about consciousness and these kids and you know I I grew up on a council estate so I spent the first few sort of years of my early life around four or five in women's refuges my dad was abusive to my mum then we ended up moving to Chester from Liverpool and there my mum had three young girls. She was a young woman herself and we had no money. So every conversation centred around debt, bills, what we don't have. And people with money had this superiority. They had this air of um, having something that I potentially couldn't access. And I was a very um, intuitive child. I was very aware of my own uh, surroundings, very self-aware. And my teachers picked up on sort of a level of intelligence that I had. They put me forward for a scholarship at the Queen's School in Chester. So around 10 or 11, I start this school and I'm living in a house where we're sharing bedrooms and we're avoiding the TV license man. And, you know, we're just trying to make ends meet. And here I now know we don't have to pay anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Which this is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I watched my mum live in fear of these people. Yeah. And that's, I lived in a household of fear, fear that the next bill wouldn't be met, fear that, you know, all we did have really was love mm -hmm. and how that love was portrayed and expressed wasn't really in the healthiest of ways. You know, there weren't conversations had that needed to be had. You know, there wasn't, um, my mum couldn't show up for us emotionally, to be honest, Leanne, because physically she had to make sure every need was met. Food in the cupboards, school uniforms on, the basics that every mum tries to do. She tries to get a handle on that. And, you know, I'm fathers. How did that affect you going to a school, um, getting a scholarship for a school? Obviously being surrounded with other, like, children that, in effect, were having a Better much more life. privileged lifestyle yeah. than what you had. How did that affect you mentally? When I look back, Leanne, I think, wow, what did you even go into? What was, I wasn't even prepared for it. The great thing was I became this chameleon where I learned how to read people. I learned how to adapt. I learned how to have empathy for people that didn't have very much and respect for people that did have a lot. Um, I've always had a huge issue with authority anyway. Um, I've always, I just don't <laughs> like to be told what to do um, and my mum will tell you that I think it's because I'm a Sagittarius but I you know I just don't like people having sort of control over me or a handle over me and I think with with it was an all girls school my sisters by now I had my little brother my mum had remarried and my little brother and my sisters were going to state schools so I was in private school but what came after that as I started to grow? So I've moved out of this sort of childhood stage. I'm moving into the teenage years. I'm starting to question why we've not got certain things because I recognise my mum had a level of um, intelligence. You know, my mum was very beautiful. All of these things. And I, I developed this resentment towards my own parents, essentially. Why don't we have these things? My mum could be this. And I made my mum feel inadequate for a long time during my teenage years. We battled a lot. Now I understand she was suffering with depression after the divorce from my dad. There was mental health issues at play and you cannot be the best version of yourself for your children when when you've got mental health issues. You just can't. And I know that now as a therapist. But what people don't realise is, you know, my dad leaving and my dad, my mum and dad getting divorced. It's not so much your dad leaving that leaves the wound. It's the woman that they leave you with. So when your dad leaves you're having to help this woman get up in the mornings, you're having to go and make sure she's giving you lunch money, making sure you've got clean clothes. You essentially become a therapist to your parent and that sets the tone for the rest of your life, the rest of your relationships because between the ages of sort of one and eight, we are in theta brain waves. You know, that's the, the brain state that we're in. It's a meditative state where we are absorbing, absorbing information from our environment 
what we see taking place. So at this point, Leanne, I've already witnessed domestic violence, manipulation, um, secrets, all of that kind of thing taking place in the home. And then those two people saying they loved each other. Mm. So to me, love is abusive. And if you love someone, you stick it out. Just stay, just stick it out. Because if you really love someone, you'll you'll hold on to it. So I saw that. I saw my mum stick it out no matter how unhappy she was. And then I also saw once she did manage to leave that she didn't know how to take care of herself. It took me a long time as, as a grown woman and as a mother and a single mother especially to learn how to take care of myself yeah. because no one had shown me. My mum didn't have, my mum didn't go to the gym. My mum didn't go and buy herself and spoil herself with things, you know, because everything she had went to us. And bless her, she must look at my Instagram and be like, was it really that bad? But it's not Aww. so much the case of it being bad. It was more, I have to acknowledge these things so that I don't repeat cycles. So you can learn, yeah. Yeah, we had great times. We had amazing holidays, you know. We made ends meet. We had fun. Had my sisters and my brother. So we got to share that trauma. A lot of people who are, you know, only children, they they don't get to share that, the sort of burden of that. So there was a lot of fun. We had a lot of happy times, but ultimately we had this, huge um, conflict in the home, a lot of chaos, a lot of trauma, which set the tone for my adult life. So after the age of eight, you start to look around and you look at authority. You look at other people's family systems. You look at where you exist. But those first eight years, what you don't realize, that's become your blueprint. Yeah. The amygdala, the part of the brain that um, stores memories, yeah. they're, they're like flash memories, like a camera. If you've experienced high levels of domestic violence or abuse, that changes in shape and size and how it um, interprets your feelings and emotions around other people from that point, it's going to take you back into the memory. So, Not even just high levels of uh, domestic abuse or, or emotional abuse. I think uh, I think as a child, well, speaking from my experience, I, my dad was abusive to mum, but I only remember, I only seen it twice. Right. One when I was, um, I can't remember how old I was. I would think I was about probably about nine. Um, but I always remember my dad being verbally um, disrespectful to my mum, right. calling her a wench and things like that, Nasty you know, and, and, and I, and I remember laughing at it because yeah. I was a bit of a daddy's girl. And yeah. I, I remember like the guilt that I felt from that and everything that, you know, with the belief coding that I do with Jess and, yeah. and learning about that. And it always takes me back to my childhood and always my dad, it comes into, it seems to be the, the, the issue call. around it, you know, and, and wanting, craving the, that, um, recognition or you know feeling abandoned or with the rejection that I got from him because he left when I was 13 but yeah. like I say he was he was abusive to my mum but my mum threw herself into work and she had three jobs so she um got herself up and she she worked hard but then again it's that level of to um to succeed you have to to work hard yeah. and then you know that's that materialistic sort of um you know throwing yourself and you have to have this this and this to be happy you yeah. know, obviously she had to work because she had to keep us like... A roof above your yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing, Leanne, a lot of people who come to work with me, they say, my parents are still together. Um, you know, I, I haven't had any trauma. I'm fine. I, I even get people who go, I was never touched. And I'm like, no, it's not, it's not <laughs> a sexual thing. You know, yeah. it's um, childhood trauma it can be... Anything. Anything that happened to you or anything that didn't happen for you, anything that you didn't have, anything that, you know, took place in front of you. Like I said, you are, it's your blueprint for how you move through life from yeah. that point. And if your dad was awful at communicating and he name called, it would be so hard for you when you are in a in a trigger or when you're angry to not say to someone you're a piece of crap you're this you're that because that's your default that's your go-to or people's words naturally might really impact you someone might say to you oh you're you're a cow or a bitch whatever it is and you might feel that a lot more deeply than than someone who sort of hasn't experienced that level of abuse but what happens I did is, until I was on Housewives and I got a whole load of abuse. And oh, God. I've got a real good thick skin now. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've learned a few words from yeah. that show, haven't you, I bet? But this is the thing, you know, people don't realise with trauma, even if you weren't seeing it, Leanne, even if you weren't witnessing it, even if it wasn't in front of you, you know, parents had 
addictions and and their own you know and we don't like to parent shame whenever I post it's you know whenever I share information we're not parent shaming our parents loved us and did the best with what they knew and I'm not talking about highly abusive parents or parents who've you know severely harmed their children I'm talking about normal family systems and a lot of their mother wounds and father wounds that break in the generational cycles that they've carried on repeating they just didn't know how to show up and so Say, for example, dad was an alcoholic and you weren't allowed to have people over for parties or sleepovers or you um, sometimes you would get really drunk and silly and, and name call mom or there'd be conflict in the house and you had to hide that. You learned very early on to uh, be private, keep secrets, or you might naturally hate people keeping things from you. It might be a huge trigger for you. On top of that, say one day dad gets drunk, falls down, he's in bed. And your instincts as a seven or eight year old say, oh, house doesn't feel great. I've just come home from school. The house feels a bit, you know, there's there's something going on here. And you say to your mom, mom, is everything okay? Where's dad? And she goes, oh, dad's fine. He's upstairs having a little sleep, just having a little nap. Now your whole body, your intuition is telling you there's something wrong. Yeah. And then your mom turns around and says to you, your main caregiver who you love and trust, who you've connected your whole sense of self to, says everything's fine. That's the first time, Leanne, that you are told to discount your own intuition, to discredit your own body. And as women especially, you know, obviously for men too, but as women, we carry on ignoring that. So we will walk down a dark alleyway at night and when our intuition says don't do it, we say stop being silly. You know, we'll get into a relationship with someone and count a few red flags and go, oh, you're being ridiculous. And we will misread our own body signals because for so long, we were told to not listen to our own bodies and that's why it's so important for our children to have a level of consciousness so that they don't trust you just because you're an adult. A lot of people get trust that they don't deserve because they're adults, because they're in grown-up bodies. Some of our children are so highly intuitive. They're so wise. Oh, we don't give them enough credit, no, do we? No, we don't. And they know people, you know, I know, you'll know with the girls, with Sky. I see her sometimes if she's not interacting with someone, I know she's picked up on a bad vibe. Might come out months later that that person's done something wrong or they might have backstabbed someone or, and I think she had it. She yeah. knew straight away. So these children are, we have to make sure that they are tuned in and listening to themselves, even if it goes against you. And I know it's hard. Um, That's the thing I think, isn't it? Teaching them to actually be aware of, of, how to deal with it how to deal with that emotion because we can't shield them from it that's 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 the awful thing about being a parent you, yeah. you have to allow them to have their journey and learn um but it's giving them the tools like you say to be able to bring that awareness to it in tune into their own energy yeah. and then not allow certain things to affect them the names the yeah. you know the what they're exposed to because they're gonna get exposed to it's all so these things aren't it's they? so hard and this is the thing as well we call it helicopter parenting when a parent feels like a child's um, independence or growth um is abandonment it feels to them like what's my purpose you know you have these people who will have a child the child will grow up and they'll carry on having more children because they need that baby they need that phase of life where they're nurturing and caring for them because they feel needed yeah um so we call it helicopter parenting so they see the child's independence as um abandonment and especially if they've not got a great relationship with the child's father or the child's mother so um we have to be very careful you know these kids are so triggering do you know that sometimes <laughs> because i didn't have a safe childhood leanne and when i say unsafe I don't want you to picture me on an NSPCC advert curled up in the corner <laughs> starving. You know, we had everything we needed, but there was no discipline there. We could play out for as long as we wanted to. We'd be in and out of each other's houses and gardens, and it was a different time then. But, you know, not safe as in we heard conversations we shouldn't have. We saw arguments, you know, and um, we we didn't really have the the guidance that, that we needed. Again, because... Anything we were lacking, anything we didn't have in the home was put on a pedestal. Now, if you attach yourself to a thing or a place or a person, the, the chase for that is going to consume you. And like when I was speaking earlier about the theta phase, you know, between age one and eight, in that theta phase, you're developing your sense of self. So say, for example, you do something and it spikes the interest of your main caregiver, who we are deeply trying to connect and attach to in those first years of survival. If you do something and you click on very early that 
it pleases them. Maybe you're great at football. Maybe you're great at piano. Maybe you're just great at reading or maybe you're the pretty child. You know, we all have parts to play in our family systems, don't we? Um, if you click on very early that your sense of self can be connected to your parent through that task or through that activity, that becomes you. Mm. So you then live and die by that trait or that characteristic or that quality that you have. I was a huge overachiever and it's very um, it's very prevalent in um especially young women who have father wounds. So when a, a father figure hasn't been around, I had a stepdad, but it's not the same. You know, my own biological father wasn't in my life. So I took on masculine traits as a way to connect back to him, which was overproductive, overachieving, shutting down my vulnerability, those types of qualities. And then when you're praised for those qualities, you start to prioritize them. So I learned very early on, I'm very smart. I'm great at doing work and homework and and that became my thing. Oh, let's get Stephanie to read a page out of the newspaper and I'd sit there and like, and that became my label. But with that label also came the pressure of, I'm gonna have to make some money for my mum. You know, from a, I shouldn't be thinking of that from a young age. And I remember I was still a problem child, even in that school, you know, I'd go to the school and I'd be like, yeah, guys just totally fitting in here. You know, I totally belong here. My house is huge as well. We just can't go there because we're decorating. And then I'd be at home, like, literally fighting over the, like, get out of my room, like, pulling each other's hair, like, oh, getting kicked out of the house. What was, what was the rivalry like between you and your sisters and your brother? Well, your brother was only yeah, little, wasn't young. he? But, but, you know, because you were at the private school and they were at state school, so was there not an element of rivalry for you because of, towards you because of that? Not really. Do you know what happened? It was actually the opposite. They were drinking from an early age. They were um, socialising. They were allowed to stay out later than me. I was doing homework. I was doing exams. Um, I was playing lacrosse. I was playing hockey. So there was this um, huge divide between us. And I almost felt like I was missing out. Yeah. Like, you know, and I'd, I'd hate getting on the bus because I had a long skirt and a blazer. So I used to walk to school in the rain. But what I was doing back then, Leon, which I didn't realise was I was manifesting a better life for myself. So in Chester, for anyone listening who knows Chester, just down near the Rudy, near the river, opposite the race course, there's this huge area called Curzon Park. Huge, big Victorian and Georgian houses. Amazing, so beautiful. And then after that is the council estate where I grew up. Now... I'd get home from school and it would be raining, and it'd be dark, you know, those long, those short winter nights where it would be pitch black. And my mum would say, where have you been? And I used to walk the long way around and just I used to, to open the gates and walk down the path as though I lived there. Or I'd just like sort of, you know, walk down the street and just stay there for a little bit. I'd ride my bike, I used to go and pick conkers down there. And back then I didn't know what manifestation was, but I knew if I was putting myself in these environments, in these places that something good was gonna come from that. So I always had that progressive nature, whether that was a way of pleasing my mom, connecting back to my dad, whether it was a way of proving that I was better than my circumstances, I don't know. Um, I've always had this thing that I like to push people is such a negative trait because some people just don't wanna be pushed. And I'm like, you could really be good at this. And they're like, I'm happy where I am, but I've always had this move forward. And I, and I don't know if I would have had that if, my dad had still been around I don't know but I know my trauma has been something I packaged and and used um in, in positive ways even though it was from a negative experience but I do remember breaking in the staff room at parents evening uh, don't ask me why I did that and we were all looking through all the notes and stuff and I was like he broke in the staff room and they had all of our names on this board and it said Stephanie needs Stephanie Ward needs nurturing you know like oh. And at the time I was like, who the hell do they think they are? Now I look back and I think, how sad is that? How sad is it? And it's not a reflection of my mum. It's almost a reflection of how good the school was because they saw something in me was lacking. I wasn't getting something at home. I wasn't being nurtured at home. I wasn't being um, emotionally embraced. I wasn't being emotionally developed. I had every... You know, my mum always says people who are rich stay rich because they don't spend their money. Whereas it was feast or famine. Anything that came in, it went straight back yeah. out. So yeah. um, my mum always, always looked amazing, always looked immaculate, you know, and we had the least amount of money. But the nurturing thing, its it really has stuck with me when I sit now and think for the teachers to recognise that in me, 
and my own mum didn't even see that you know it's that's quite important to sort of focus on isn't it mm. <sighs> yeah so I just wanted to also ask you about your post about the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp um, yeah. post for me this is obviously I could was reading the post and reading obviously your um, digression of everything and and yeah. your theory on where they've like their their past and their ch childhoods and yeah. how it, how it's affected them and obviously this is the the patterns that we're talking about isn't it for me I mean knowing about the world I know you said like in your post about it being some big pantomime I feel like it's just one big distraction, distraction. but it's not saying we can't learn from what we're watching here and what we're I have not really watched it to be honest but your um input on that is really interesting because obviously that gives you an insight into the relationships and how it affects us. What mm. is your take on what is actually going on there? Because I think she's a really good, well, she's a really bad actor, sorry. They're both actors, yeah. which then springs alarm bells to me. But the fact that people are so drawn into it and it is yeah. just a big, one big sort of, like, I feel like I'm with I'm with you, Leanne. So my level of consciousness, I'm there. I see it, you know. Why didn't we get access to the, um, the Maxwell trial, you know, and the... Jeffrey Epstein trial. Exactly. Why have we not had access to any of these? Why have we not had access to the Hillary Clinton exactly. trial? I'm aware of all of that. I do think that there's something bigger at play, something bigger going on. Um, I do think it's a, a show. It looks like a little TV show. But essentially, for me as a psychotherapist, if I don't address some of the issues that are coming up in it, um, people are going to be confused by the trial. You know, I'm just addressing things like borderline personality disorder, trauma bonding, childhood trauma. If this was a real trial, if this was something that people were genuinely going through, um, then how would they handle it? How would they sort of go through it? And the thing with this is, what I'm witnessing is she's been accused of um, something called malingering. So it's when you act up and pretend that you have conditions. It's like when a child is young and says, Mom, I need a plaster and there's nothing wrong with them. Like that... Um, like a hypochondriac type thing. Um, but with malingering, it's more emotional. So she's been accused of that. And the interesting thing is she's been accused of that and yet she's still doing that. The thing that I'm seeing is that I've noticed people seem to have an issue with is her lack of tears. So it seems like the emotion's there, but the tears are not coming. So we've I've watched now probably about 16 hours of this trial wow. and there has not been a single tear. And she's, she's wiping it. She's acting like it is. So... I don't know if that's because she has a complete lack of vulnerability. She shut down from her abusive childhood. And um, one of the comments she made, Leanne, was she saw Johnny crying at one point. He was sobbing, crying, and it was just really weird because I've never seen a man cry. So we already have an idea surrounding vulnerability for her. But the way I'm having to word it for my take on it, I can't have a personal opinion. I have to have a professional one. And what we do ha have to identify here is that here are two people. Now, forget your personal opinions on her. We've got two people here. There's a huge age difference between them. He's got a lot of power, a lot of money, and she is at a disadvantage from the get-go. So they are both abused. You know, that isn't, um, you can call it domestic abuse, but it's more um, relationship abuse. It's more, you know, partner abuse. They're abusing each other. They've learned how to abuse. And they've learned that if you love each other you stick it out similar to what I said to you earlier on if you love someone you'll keep going you'll keep fighting for them we have that sort of idea of um saving each other you know being in the sort of the depths together you're in the trenches and that's what I'm picking up here but um that's the thing I think with um so many relationships they do just they do just stay because it's that till death do us part isn't yeah. it and that not wanting to break that um the Cycle. marriage because well obviously I think the generations previous have always been like you know you just push things under the carpet you don't say anything and you stick with it because it's um you know you should be grateful should be yeah. grateful for what you've got that's that's a, a I great always, thing I was yeah. so grateful to be yeah. with dad even my mum made a comment after I'd had Sky and said um you know I had a law degree man yeah I'd just given birth to a sick child and was sat in the hospital and my mum's comment was Oh, I always knew she'd end up with someone successful, like a footballer or something. Wow. 
that's my own mum. Like, wow. what about my own achievements? And so when you come That wasn't a, about you, though. Yeah. That was just about her probably aspiring to... That level to, of yeah. success, you know. And yeah. even when we used to have disagreements and arguments, they would want us to figure it out because of his status, because of that. But with this trial, going back to... to to this situation I can't look at Amber as Amber Heard I look at her and I think oh my goodness look at the state of her what is she doing she's lying she's saying she's got PTSD but when we have PTSD the amygdala I told you earlier on shrinks so the recall for memory is very slight it's you know your your physical body remembers um it because your body keeps score so it remembers and that's why you have the physical symptoms but your actual recollection of the the, she's got too much memory here and too much description and he did this and then no photos and no proof so it's either a pantomime for the public or this woman's an abuser but what we can't discount here and discredit which a lot of people have is that he is an abuser and a lot of feminists have come out um and said the problem isn't here that um we're not saying that amber heard's not an abuser what we're saying is Women are at risk of being abused every single day by these men. We're not not saying Johnny Depp, we're saying men. Women are unsafe. We can't go for a run without being at risk. We can't get in a taxi on our own without being at risk. We have learned that we have to, instead of teaching men to treat women in a better way and teaching our sort of sons to be safe, essentially we're trying, we're teaching women how to protect themselves. It's disgusting to try and exist in this this patriarchy and live up to this big daddy power that we have to bow down to all the time so that's what the trial represents it's not about amber and johnny it's about here is another woman being abused by the man and you've got thousands of women calling her out for how she looks and why how ugly she is and look how she cries and look she's a liar there's been absolutely no support for her whatsoever yet again another woman not being believed in the system and when these women go into these that could be a normal woman in the courts with a footballer or with a successful man and she does not stand a chance. Mm. She is going to... Women are not believed and that's the issue. There are thousands of men abusing women every single day, killing, raping, whether it's in relationships or outside with strangers and yet here we are, when we see it in front of us, we still have the man's back. We still support Do you think that's been done on purpose then? You know, that that she's been portrayed as that to obviously like create more of a level of... um, um, d- diversion um, sorry not diversion division between men, and, men women. and women yeah and well, that, that f- and keep that fear going f- f- from from women f- uh, of, of not being a know bully. your place that kind of thing yeah well the, the issue that you've got here Leon, is that she for years and years you know um, histrionic personality disorder it shouldn't even be classed as a thing as a therapist I don't really truly diagnose it or acknowledge it it basically is the idea that a woman has this craziness this hysteria this um out of character personality out of balance and it's thrown at women in the court system the court system's extremely toxic and archaic you know even women that ring the police often have their children removed from their care for being abused it's like he's abused you and you're going yeah. to be punished and lose your children via multi-agency services. So it's a hard, it's a hard situation to be in. Luckily, she doesn't have that case going on with him. But what is happening here is that the easiest thing to call her is crazy and a psycho. Borderline personality disorder, which already has huge stigma attached to it. People don't want to come out and say they have BPD because of things like this. So they are attaching so much stigma to these personality disorders and labeling it with abuse. And they're so focused on her abuse. They both equally have both admitted to abusing each other. So I think that's where there's a lot of problem. Where I can relate to her is that she's saying, I've protected you. I deleted the pictures. I didn't come out and say anything. I didn't even give a statement. And here you are bringing me to court to sue me for just saying a little bit of it. Because he came out and said, I'm not an abuser, she's a liar. So she came out and said, I actually was a victim of sexual assault and this and this and this in my relationship. You forced her to defend herself. And now that she has, you want to sue her for it. Even the money that she pledged to charity, they're now criticising her for that. You're not an activist, you're a, you're, you know, you're a fake, you're a phony. She said, I couldn't give the money because he's been suing me. I couldn't release any funds because Johnny Depp is suing me. So here she is on the stand saying so much I could have said there's so much I could have brought out and done I could have really I could have really hurt him and I didn't and here he is 
forcing me. She's like, I don't want to be here. So a lot of women go into situations where they protect abusive men. Um, again, we're not saying that Amber hasn't abused him. She's done horrific things to him. We've heard the tapes. He's done things to her. He's an addict. Living with an addict is a special kind of hell because you never get the true person. You're always sidelined for the addiction. You know, if she does have BPD, borderline personality disorder, she already doesn't know how to exist in a healthy way in relationships. She fears abandonment, whether it's real or imagined. So here are two people reenacting these childhood cycles and they're doing it live. Mm. So when I'm speaking on my my platform, Leanne, I'm not saying I've got her back or his back. What I'm saying is here is a system that still needs to be changed, a system where women are more angry at Amber Heard than they are at the men who are raping and abusing us every single day. Yeah. How are you like? How are you taking the time out of your day every day to tweet about this woman that she's not crying, that she's not doing this? Take your focus away from that and just look at it. Um, this court case is like a microcosm of bigger things taking place, and that's what I like to speak on. It's more. It's not them as individuals. You know, I couldn't give two craps if they. Yeah. You know, if their Tell relationship the doesn't work yeah. out, whatever. But for me, it's a representation of, you know, what if he has been abused. Why are we sheltering him now? <gasps> There's been a man who's been abused. Thousands of women. We can't even go for a job. Yeah, yeah. We can't even be safe. It's a desensitization, I think, of it all, isn't it? That's yeah. that's what gets me. Um, Something's going to come out that's distracting us. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you say, or I actually was in um, div, um, iconic, and we went on the street and we were asking people about the case and their views yeah. on it, and ninety percent of them knew about that case but then the second question after that we asked what well, about the Gillian Maxwell case what were your views on that and I think about two people like had heard of it didn't even know but didn't even know what was going on but this I just think like, they're all puppets yeah here you've got a Disney he's essentially a Disney character isn't he yeah you know he's Tim Burton's puppet he's he's been doing those movies for years then Disney you've got this likable lovable rogue here exactly there yeah. couldn't have been anyone better than Johnny Depp to defend yeah. as a man there couldn't have been anyone worse than Amber Heard you know because she has come out and been abusive in the past in her um because she was married to a woman she was abusive in that relationship so here they are pulling up all their files this is what they do they're just put, same with will smith lovable will smith slaps chris rock on stage oh uh, i mean it to me like i say it's all a one big distraction well pfizer like, had um just released their new medication for, for alopecia. alopecia yeah so it was i like, mean it's not even rocket science like <laughs> even people that have been awake to all this bullshit have been like do you think it was fake i'm like yeah <laughs> I can't believe that I'm in a group at the moment because we're going to Saint Tropez and one of the girls had said you know um oh, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do I know we're all going away but I'm not vaccinated and I was like I'm not either how dare you assume that I am you know so even people are still I'm not vaccinated I am not sorry wow. for not being vaccinated no, me neither. <laughs> in fact if you are vaccinated oh, no. you should apologize to me yeah because <laughs> you're shedding all over you know my mum um Again, another depiction of someone who is completely living in fear. My mum went and had, because she's got underlying health issues anyway, from years of taking antidepressants, she went and had a vac vaccination. And I was like, you're a government slag. That's what you are. And my mum loves who I am. My mum loves how I speak. She loves how I advocate for myself. She loves how conscious I am. But it's not for her. For some reason, she can't get there. And I think this is the issue, trying to wake people up that are happy to be asleep. Mm. It's wasted energy. Even, you know, some people are like, oh God, I wish I'd not even took the red pill because it's 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 rough out there. And <laughs> yeah. It can be so rough. Even, I mean, the dating world was tough, wasn't it, beforehand? Now it's like... I know. How, do you have any childhood trauma? What's your relationship like with your mum? Are you vaccinated? Yeah. No, you just wouldn't well, even it's all, attempt all, it. Well, like, my friend of mine was looking through, I'm not on any dating websites, but um, not that there's nothing wrong with it, but, yeah. I mean, it's too new for me anyways. But the, the, the thing that's very um apparent is the the actual signs of whether they've been vaccinated or not oh on, you can on put the, it yeah oh, stop it yeah no well i suppose it's good because you'd keep away from well people. yeah yeah you can yeah. yeah but i always say you know well if the masks work then why did you have the vaccine 
And yeah. if the vaccine works, then why are you still wearing a mask? There's one lady that we interviewed again on the street and she was an older lady, but she was saying she's triple vaxxed and I wear my mask and, you know, it's everyone's due diligence to do the same and protect each other. And um, obviously I was interviewing her and I, was, I wanted to have, like delve into it, but it was only some quick questions and she went on and on. And then in the end, at the end of it, I turned around to her and I said, can I, oh, she did a little dance and she was a really fun lady. And Aww. I said, oh, can I have a hug? And she was like, yeah. She didn't have a mask on and she gave me a hug. So do you know she'd what? forgotten the condition. For- yeah. And this is the thing. I think what a lot of these old people have from war times is this sort of camaraderie where they're like, oh, we're all sticking together and it's not the same anymore. Yeah. This is medical, you know, this is biological warfare. Mm. This isn't going to war and waving off our men and all sticking together and, and live, we don't live in communities anymore. Yeah. This is why being a single mum is so, so tough because years ago you got help with your children, you know, and now you don't, you know, you we used to live in areas where we knew people, we had relatives and our children would be able to go to Nan's house and the, see their cousins and, and we'd get support in the communities. We don't have support in the communities anymore. We're so isolated. We're in a horrible, horrible phase right now and and I'm always torn between making sure Sky is aware of it and she's got a level of awareness and also maintaining her innocence. Mm. Um, yeah, so Mason Greenwood couldn't not touch on that, could we? Um, and, you know, I've been in a, in a toxic situation now and you know what happened with me and Dan. I won't speak on it now because at some point me and Dan are going to have to address that because it wasn't how it was portrayed in the media. I do think the media have a field day with these things. They love a chance to tear a footballer down but you know again what I heard in those voice notes that was the proof there similar to the Johnny Depp and Amber thing there were men that I'm friends with that I would put my life in it that you know there are good people and would have the right judgment over that that were putting in sort of group chats saying um oh maybe it was role play maybe it was even though they yeah. had they had the it voice was note sickening it was sickening to me that, listening to proof. that and it triggered me as well yeah um from my relationship like you know uh, that i've had previous it's um yeah when you when you when you've experienced that you know it's it's not it's really not nice and it takes you back to that to that memory and i just can't get around anyone that would say, I, the thing is the thing about putting it on social media and, yeah. and all that, but they're so young as well. Yeah. And maybe it was just a way of making sure she was believed and make sure she was heard. And um, Well, these men aren't nurtured, are they? These young boys are not nurtured. I mean, he's not a man, but um, that football world is just toxic because there's no feminine influence. There's no balance there. Uh, women aren't really respected in the game. Um, I think that's why we all hail Karen Brady because she survived that world. Um, I know there's a lot of women that do have a, an input, but essentially they have to still take on masculine traits to exist and survive that world. Because, you know, I think she sent one player to, she sold a player because when she got on the bus once for an away trip, he commented on her breasts. And so, you know, you you do get an idea of what that world is like. And it's impossible for people to come out as gay in that world because it's got this high masculine presence. Yeah. So anything that Mason Greenwood was doing in that situation, he felt entitled to do. And, you know, even, do you know what baffled me, Leanne, which blows my mind? Her dad came out and tried to, like, justify it. Like, he almost justified why she'd posted it on Instagram instead of being like, this young lad has done this to my daughter. When I get my hands on him, watch what happens there were no threat he he said we can't believe this has happened you know we loved him and it's like we loved what we loved him you know we loved him he's 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 been around us the family embraced him and you know they've had a few difficult and it's like did you hear what we just heard because if that was my daughter I would have a shotgun at the door ready to go like just no questions asked or I'd be saying to Dan you better get there and sort him out yeah I could not listen to a voice note of my daughter as a mother saying please get off me I don't want to have sex with you please stop and him saying oh, listen to my family and him saying him coming back saying you know you could hear the motions on yeah. the on the this is one thing with um, yeah, I, I, not me having my father figure around when I was in the abusive relationship I was 
just used to lie there and think like I just wanted my dad to come and rescue me yeah. I wanted to, him to come and take me out of that situation and I would ring my mum up and she would set off and then have to stop at the services because there was no mobiles and then yeah. turn around because I'd tell her it's all right he's apologized and he's not going to do it again and you know that and you that, do believe it yeah you do yeah. believe it because you've watched it yeah. you've watched your mum forgive dad yeah. You've, I watched my mum forgive my dad. I watched my mum then remarry straight away and she didn't really have healthy boundaries. Like I said, she didn't know how to take care of herself. We lived in chaos and, and we survived in chaos. And and this is the thing. Luckily, she recorded it, but is that what we have to do now? Yeah, exactly. Do we have to record ourselves when our, our partners get into bed with us? And, yeah. you know, even in relationships, when you say no, if you don't want to have sex with someone, it's still considered rape, even if it's in a marriage or whatever. And these issues aren't addressed. You don't have complete control over a woman's body just because you're in a relationship with her. No. And we don't teach this with our children at school. We don't even teach our children to listen to their bodies then. Obviously, our kids are going to be different with their conscious classrooms, but in normal schools, you know, I just I have a lot of knowledge that I didn't need. I know about the Palace of Versailles. I know about Hitler. I know about Henry VIII. Yeah, Why? Why? yeah. Something that actually Lola said on the way to school this morning was, you know, at school, like they're, they're not supposed to like all the stuff that we learn. Like, why don't they teach you how to pay tax? I was like, because you're not supposed to be paying tax anyways, Lola. Like, yeah, because they know it's illegal. That's yeah. why they know they they're trying to hide it. it. But they do it in, you know, they say, don't they? They they're doing it to us in in plain sight. They're actually yeah. doing it under our noses. Yeah. It's so obvious yeah. that you think it can't be that obvious and. Like you say, with schools and mortgages and all of these things, you know. The death pledge. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it, why? Why do we have to pay off a house? Because it's still not yours. Because if they want to send a bailiff in or if they want to send someone in, they'll send them anyway. Yeah. So you might as well rent. So, you know, we, we have to take back that autonomy. We have to start teaching our children to break cycles, listen to their bodies and not trust these people. Because these people, look at them, they're getting caught in affairs love triangles and not wearing their own masks and vaccines they haven't got a clue what they're doing no. they're just puppets and we're all bowing down to these people uh, well yeah and what we would need to do more importantly is is teaching the kids um the, the the men to stand in their you know when you say masculinity as well that it's more about that but it's a protection thing for, Healthy for what, yeah standing energy. in our sovereign femininity not 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 like we don't need men because for me I think there's been a bit a, a massive like cloud sure. um, feminist women of, of, of the feminism is about women not needing men and disregarding men and and we we and I've been guilty of this demasculating a man in a relationship by yeah. taking too much control and having them feel like they don't have they're, they're not able to to do to take care of us in that protective mode and give us that security and safety yeah. and that we have to take a level of responsibility for we that as well balance yeah. yeah and this is what's happened there and what people don't realize is John Major wanted the nuclear family, didn't he? He wanted the um, parents, the mum at home with the children because he he believed that that's what would make healthier children. So 70s, 60s and 70s, it was starting to become sort of acceptable for families to separate, parents to separate. You're going into 80s now. You've got a huge sort of drug boom, you know, the party scene. Everyone's listening to trance. Everyone's having casual sex. You're moving into 80s and 90s. Again, we are now... To just say the frequency, the music and everything. I think everything's played a changed. Yeah. Massive impact on that. Yeah, 100% on your consciousness. Yeah. You've got Margaret Thatcher in, in power. She closes all the mines. So we've now got people in poverty, places like Liverpool, places like up north um, who rely on certain trades. Now you've got men who are emasculated in the home because they've got no trade anymore. They've got no, a lot of people started to sell drugs. They use those ports for drug dealing and it's a whole other topic. But what I wanted to touch on is we essentially, us as women in our age group and us as men, are the product, the first generation of children from broken families mm. from the 80s and 90s because before that it was quite unacceptable a lot of people yeah. stayed together so we are now f the first so we find it normal to be single parents and it was actually the Rockefeller Foundation who promoted the women's empowerment movement because they said how can we tax men and women exactly get the women out of the home how can we indoctrinate the children 
get them Education. into school for eight. Yeah. So when I've done a live before now on my account and you know, I've had women who were like, I'm a single mom and I'm great and you know, and I and I'm and I do everything and I'm like, Okay, how much time do you spend with your child? Well, you know, okay, so you pick your child up at half five, six o'clock, because that's what time you finish work. You rush some dinner down and probably a takeaway or a microwave meal. Um, you're so stressed from the day and trying to get yourself undressed and showered after a long day at work, trying to keep on top of the house, that you're really ignoring everything that they're saying to you. You do a little bit of homework, you get them bath and you put them into bed, and then you can breathe because they're out of the way. And then the next day you repeat, tell me again why you don't need a man. Tell me again why you don't need a man. You do need a man to do the school run. You need a man who's going to contribute to bills so you can work part-time so you don't have to run yourself ragged. And also so that you're you're teaching your children something because your children are lacking completely emotionally because teachers are not going to love your children. Teachers can't raise your children. The school are raising your children. And then they're being raised and taught to join the same rat race that you are mm. sort of engulfed by. You're, yeah. It's and a constant yeah, like so hamster wheel, isn't it? This single mother rhetoric, and I can speak of it because I've been a single mum and I've been doing that and I prided myself on on getting everything done. And I'd tick it off at the end of the day to go again, just tired, exhausted, grey hairs coming through, not got no time to have your nails done, got no time to spend time with the kids. You don't even know your children. Yeah, again, it's like, again, the marketing though, isn't it? It's that's gone into it. It's the, the, I've seen so many magazine covers and it was an, something on social media and it was showing all the um, front covers, of, covers of, of, I think it was like some family magazine and it was all, there was no, there was no man, woman, like there was no yeah. family unit. It was this, the mum with the kids or the dad with the kids. I think it was it was more like... It's intentional to make yeah, it look like... It's normal. Yeah, it's but funny. actually the, the 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 beauty of of life is finding a partner and a relationship that fulfills... You fulfill each other yeah. and or you don't, support Or don't each, have kids. Yeah. Or don't have kids. If you do not have the wisdom and the you know, sort of the knowledge to work through cycles and raise your children differently, then don't have children because essentially those children are going to be victims of broken homes and repeat the cycle, yeah. dependent on the state, stuck paying taxes and, you know, getting a good house and a bigger house and a better car and then you die. You know, it's, people don't do things for joy anymore. How many women do you know go horse riding or paint or read? don't have time oh yeah we're exhausted we're absolutely would was and then we're praised for the high functioning i have so many and clients. then that's that cycle yeah. of you saying you've the high high achiever the one in the yeah. praise that you get then oh yeah i'm doing a good job and like you know look at me i'm successful look at me i'm an entrepreneur i'm doing it for myself yeah and obviously things happen like but relationships break down and, and people grow yeah. separately don't we which is what's happened Naturally, in my personal yeah. circumstance but i um but oh God, do I not want to be in a relationship? Of course I do. Like, of course, but I, I want one that is right for me at this time in my yeah. life. And, and that just wasn't anymore. But allowing Wes to, to be there for the kids and the girls in a, because um, Wes has to have healthy masculine and feminine energy as well. Naturally, you have to have healthy masculine and feminine so that you can allow him the space. Because when you have a father wound, subconsciously, you don't trust men you will never think that Wes can love your girls as much as you love them. Oh, I know he loves them, but not as much as me. We have this little mistrust that, you know, that they might not feed them right, that they might not get them, pick them up on time, that they may not love them wholeheartedly or die for them the way we would. And that comes from a, a core father wound um, and a mistrust for men. And that's what we're breeding into our daughters. That's what we're growing up seeing now. Women just not trusting men and can you blame us? Because look at the society we live in, but essentially in your own home, outside of it, it's a different matter. In your own home, if you can balance out those masculine and feminine energies and create life that is um, where you're able to ask for help and be vulnerable and be soft and mm. be in your feminine energy, you're going to be so much healthier and so yeah. much happier. So f fast forward a bit to um, you meeting... Um Sky's dad. Yeah, Sky's dad, I'll say. Um, and how that relationship um, c connected you and with the realization, yeah, that shaped you and the realization of of um, how your past, I mean, obviously that came afterwards, didn't it? So, yeah. so you, you met and your dreams were 
met then, I suppose, this manifestation of this big house and this lifestyle that you'd wanted as a child, I suppose, was brought into fruition, wasn't it? Well, believe it or not, Leanne, at uni, I didn't actually like staying in student accommodation. So I used to get myself in huge amounts of debt to stay in. I had a penthouse in Newcastle. Um, it's called Pandan Gate at the time. It's like the best apartment in the corner. And I was using my student loan to pay it off because I thought staying in student accommodation is <laughs> grotty. So even back then, I was really trying to like push myself forward. But um, when I met Danny, he was doing his YTS anyway. So he wasn't on very much money. Um, I had my own car and he had, um, it was a little Audi at the time that he'd been gifted because Man United were uh, sponsored by Audi, I think at the time. I remember um, them, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I was sharing that with with Dan's friend um, coming sort of up and down. But I'd come from Chester and, like I said, I'd come from this estate and half my family were from Liverpool and they were hugely racist. Um, not in a, in a way that it was, they wouldn't action it. It was more, you know, so, sort of covert racism, mm. comments made mm. um, about white people being better than black. And we know now that, again, it's the state and the government's way of maintaining control because... Division. Yeah. You know, white people and black people, especially poor people, in a sense, you're no better than each other. But the government have convinced white people that they're somehow better, even if they have less than a black person. So... You know, I had this um, granddad who's hugely racist. I hadn't grown up around very many black people. And then I met Dan, who was mixed race and all blingy and couldn't like, just shine a new pin. Um, and we fell in love instantly. Well, what I thought at the time was falling in love. Now I see it was a trauma bond. We had very similar backgrounds, you know, single mom. Um, his dad hadn't been around. And this drive to succeed, to do better. And I was doing my law degree at the time at Newcastle. He was, like I said, starting out at Man United. So when I think back over where we connected, I didn't realize that him and I were connecting over those horrible experiences that were sitting in our subconscious. So like I said, your first eight years is your blueprint. You then move into this sort of phase of your life where you're questioning everything you go through these different phases in life but you still have that blueprint thesis phase of what you think love is so um hugely attracted to each other but during that relationship man I was made to feel like I'll give you an example of the comment he made once um I knew I wanted to be with you because I always asked myself if I broke my leg tomorrow, who would be there? And it would be Steph. So it was almost like I was rewarded for my loyalty. Now, this feeling I had of proving myself to him, look how loyal I am, look how strong I am, look how independent I am. I didn't realize at the time that my independence would at some point become a threat to that relationship. I didn't realize that my achievements would have to be paused for a second while we allowed him to shine. Because I was so focused on um, him attaching to me, him liking me, him wanting me. And that had been a theme throughout my life. Every room I'd gone into, do they like me? Do they accept me? Am I enough? And you know yourself now at this age, Leanne, you literally say, I don't care. But it takes a long time to get to that point. And my mum used to say to me, oh, I would never relive my 20s for anyone but my 30s. That's when I, I felt good. And I never understood why. And now I get it because I didn't have any boundaries. Um, I had this huge, horrible idea of what masculinity was. Anything I learned from men had come from my granddad um, and also the media and TV programs. So my little brain, my little childhood teenage brain had pieced together what a man should be. And so when him and I started arguing or um, he used to break up with me every summer, you know, June, um, and the season would finish and I'd get back together with him for pre-season and you know when I think back it's, it's horrific yeah this is the thing though with uh, I think with football as well they are um like a lot of footballers have come from um underprivileged backgrounds and and been have been so focused on on that sport and they've that's they've lived it haven't they they've yeah. they've they've done that's all they've wanted to do and obviously now obviously with phones and stuff and the sort of the glamorization of of the 
um the lifestyle. celebrity lifestyle yeah. if you will it's not so much about the sport it's sort of like everything that comes with it whereas then it was just like football 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 and they did it day in day out and that's all they wanted to do and um I'm not saying the people that are playing football now don't deserve where they are and they don't work hard at it but it's like almost um everything's done for them everything's um you know they're told when to eat when to go to bed when to get up yeah. when to you know they're so the, regimented the, 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 I always say it's like the army yeah is. yeah and, and that causes problems in itself I think because they don't really know how to do much for themselves do they and and you know everyone's individually different but I think so many yes people around them and so many people just doing them telling them what to do telling them where to put the money yeah. and obviously the financial thing in you know, like with regards to to us has been a huge impact on well they don't have any um like you said because football takes sort of precedence over everything they don't have this opportunity to to develop any other skills mm. they're not really out in the no. real world you know I used to think that with me and Dan that we'd had this same struggle and really essentially we hadn't because he'd gone into uh, digs quite early on you know and his mum gave him a great life she actually remarried even though he had a tough uh, probably first like 10 years of his life was tough after that his mum had you know remarried they had money and things they had a good life and then he went into digs so I believed he had the same level of struggle as me. Um, you know, moving away to Newcastle with, you know, no money behind you and no family there. And, you know, I really had to try and establish myself and I fell out with people and I argued with people and I was really trying to find my footing when I'd been on this small little sort of community, this little estate for so long and trying to develop who I was and, and connect to who I was at such a young age. And then going into that relationship, like you said, he his path was already set he just had to show up every day that's all he had to do mm. and I was there like hey hey where, yeah. where do I fit in and I gradually learned that in order for me to to exist in his space I'm going to have to shrink and it's something I'd never done before I was known and my sense of self was connected for my achievements for my um because where I came from it didn't matter what I did Leanne had already um, exceeded people's expectations you know I, I'd lived in women's refuges in Toxteth and then moved to Chester I wasn't meant to be doing a law degree at university so anything beyond that I was still going to be doing better than what my parents had done and you know my mum actually came from a great family she just married my dad and that toxic relationship destroyed any of her own achievements and my biggest thing in life was to never repeat that cycle and I repeated the cycle because I didn't have the awareness to to know how to stop it mm. until later on when it had already happened. And so no matter how much you tell yourself, I'm not going to be that person, I'm not going to be like my mom, you feel yourself going that way, you feel yourself speaking and responding yeah. the same way because it's it's your blueprint. And so, you know, with, um, with Dan, because of football, you know what it's like, Leanne, you do everything early. You know, you buy a house early, you get cars early, you have children early because uh, life's already exacerbated by their fame their their sort of um achievements the money all of that so Dan got his first big contract and he was actually Alex Ferguson was sick to the death of him just wanted him gone so I think he asked Roy Keane to take him on at Ipswich and then we had the issue with um there was a girl who was murdered and Dan had had something to do with her and Roy Keane said, no, not having you here, not touching you, you're a trouble causer. Um, he'd, I think he'd had to testify in court because her boyfriend had murdered her and there'd been some. So I got pulled into that. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm trying to still go to lectures and seminars um, and then still try and support his career. So then um, Chris Hewton said he'd take him on loan to Newcastle, which was great because I was in Newcastle as well. And then he tore his Achilles tendon and I had to leave work to take care of him then. So I was working, I had three jobs at the time. I think I was doing work at River Island, Faith, I remember the shoe shop. Yeah. And I used to do hair extensions in the back of the shop um, for the people that used to come in. And then I was working at living room. So even in those, he'd got his big contract. I think he was about £12,000 a week at that point, And I was still working three jobs I wasn't benefiting from that money you know and 
I didn't have a voice. I didn't have, um, people have this misunderstanding that you enter a relationship with a footballer and bam, your life changes. You know, it's, it's not that, you know, it's their life changes. Yeah. They're out. You just tag along with them. You're just literally observing everything. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. If anything, it kind of, it slows down your own progress. Yeah. Well, oh my God, with me, massively, I've just, doing the show, I think, was the turning point for me as of my wanting yeah. to do, well, just before that, starting the kids' clothing, I sort of thought I was ready to do thing. I'd been at home. And yeah. obviously, I think it was the opposite with me. Seeing my mum work three jobs and have to, like, slog her guts out every yeah. day. I met Wes, um, and then I... I, because I, I was at college and then I did beauty therapy and I got a job and then when I got pregnant I really was looking forward to just being able to stay at home with rest, the kids yeah. and being able to pick them up from school drop them off and be there all the time whereas I didn't want to when I see my mum my mum was never at home and we used yeah. to come home after make our own tea she'd give us a list of jobs we'd have to do and I just really wanted to be at home and so and then obviously all the wag culture got slated yeah. for that because you know we were, I wasn't working and and that hit me, that judgment hit me. It's like been one judgment after another and then obviously housewives and then, you know, the exploitation of wealth through that. But that was sort of the the turning point for me of the actually doing something for me. And it wasn't about being in the limelight. It was more about um, just being able to do something for me to make my own money. Something for you. Yeah, yeah. and that, I feel Wes found that difficult because... It wasn't, um, he didn't like the show anyways. He didn't yeah. want to be, he's always been very, um, just wanted to play football, not interested in anything other than that. So key, for me yeah. to be in the limelight or be on the social media and my following and want him to be part of that, he just didn't want that part of life, but potentially didn't want me being more... Um, the no, yeah, or yeah, I was, I was growing. I was, wasn't the shrinking, the shrinking valley. I've always feel like I've always found, tried to put myself in relationships where I've somebody could look after me. I was like, yeah. felt that somebody would be able to, um, like even female relationships. I've always been attracted to a strong female relationship or a, a man that felt like you know that they could sweep me off my feet. You needed and, that discipline. So yeah. we either have, if we have a controlling father doesn't have to be abusive controlling in the sense if you do have a lot of discipline you're told when to come home at time we look for that control with we just repeat the cycle with yeah. romantic relationships and and we almost have this feeling of being saved we're like yeah. we want to be saved that's we what be i was the dreamt of yeah being rescued of the first relationship with uh, i left ho home and was with when i was 16 yeah and then ended up with a guy that beat me up and did the same things that my dad did but obviously i got away from him but yeah it's like that you know, that realisation, it's only really been in my 40s that I've really started looked at yourself. to, just yeah. Look, just looked at your own, I do it, I look and I think, did I really do that? You know, because I did a lot of crying and a lot of FBI work just to stay. And mm. I, I exhausted myself, I remember being, because I didn't know what I was setting myself up for. I thought I'd be able to maintain my independence. And one thing I will say, Leanne, about the football world that I really despise is that the media um you know the newspapers and all of that what they tend to do is they feel comfortable to have a say on these men and women but because the men represent a culture because the men represent a club because they are tied by a contract and they are essentially um performing or, or um playing for a team for the people that they're not allowed to speak up so what happens is the men don't speak up the men just go and play football now if you've got a strong female female partner she will be the one that speaks up Mm. then she's hated for it. Yeah. Now, because you do have these, um, it's a very masculine world, world before the podcast. I know you said to me, oh, let's speak about that in the podcast. You enter in this very masculine world. Now, I had very masculine energy anyway, so I was fine with it. But what I couldn't, what I really struggled with, Leanne, is that I identified myself based on how I could help others whether that was cooking, cleaning, um, helping them with a business plan, helping them with a CV, um, doing their washing, whatever it was, I'd posi I positioned myself in people's lives and call it manipulative if you want to. Um, I always say in narcissistic relationships where there's a narcissist, the codependent is equally as manipulative 
because you are trying to get the narcissist to love you in ways that you know how, best ways you know how. And that's what I did with Dan. Um, I used all of my resources to try and get him to love me and stay close to me. And essentially all he wanted was the loyalty. Now, he would have people for everything. There was a job for everyone, you know? And so trying to find my footing in my place, my, my footing then and my my position in his life felt, felt very unstable because of that. And then when I had Sky, that was my stability, you know? I actually didn't want children at that point. I'd worked so hard to get my law degree. I'd graduated. I was, I'd just been approved for my training contract. I was moving to Leeds and I had this really bad acne and I, he said to me, do you want to go to the club doctor at Newcastle, see what they say, see if he can give you anything for it. And I found out I was pregnant and I hope she never ever listens to this podcast because you'll hate me, but he was ecstatic. He was so happy. Um, and every argument we had after that, I was like, you wanted this baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, he was ecstatic. I remember, I think he'd been to a Drake concert and he was like, um, I can't speak right now, I'm busy. And I just wanted to tell him. And I was like, please, I need to tell you something. Can you call me? No, I'm busy. And then I texted him and, said, and he rang me and he was like, right, get your stuff. Just just come back to mine. Just move back in with me. Because um, I'd moved to Leeds for my training contract. Just get your stuff. And I was like, no, I... I put everything in bin bags, went to Newcastle. He, oh, and it was very romantic, very chaotic, um, very much like this fantasy that I'd created in my head. It was very much, you know, this this feeling of, oh, that's it, he has saved me. But like I said, I didn't know what was going to be ahead. I didn't realise what I would have to sacrifice in order to coexist with him. And I'm not very good at keeping my mouth shut and I'm not very good at... <laughs> But I did, I did it. But I, like I said, Leanne, the conflict was there. I, I wasn't a very good wag, to be honest. <laughs> I wasn't. Um, but you know that it was a very good wag. A very good wag. Oh. Um, but I, I mean, I hate that term anyway. But no, I just me too. It, it annoys me because there's so many amazing, strong, accomplished um, women with qualifications with footballers. Yeah. And they're just completely discredited and discounted because of football. And and that was me, you know, it was almost like, and I think everyone's dream is to be able to raise their children and live an easy life and and not have to work so hard. You know, we all want to be successful and have a part of us that we are But money doesn't make to. bring happiness. But oh, we lived in this huge house in Newcastle um, and all I did every day, Leon, was clean and plan his dinner and walk to Sainsbury's and come back. And it was just like, is this it? Is this, like, I I felt more at home in the struggle. I felt more comfortable in the, haven't made my rent this month. Oh my God, have I made my car payment this month? Oh my God, is my student loan coming in? Oh my God, what if I lose my job? I felt more at home in that because that's what I'd known. And so what it's happened familiar. was I created the chaos. Right. Here I had this peaceful space. And you know, um, Whenever people sort of ask me about the relationship with Dan, we very rarely argued in the home. We never argued around Sky. It was always after he'd left. He's had this huge abandonment wound, which caused a lot of self-sabotage. So me as myself, as just a woman who was raising his daughter, I had this underlying belief from that first eight years that I wasn't lovable. Of course I wasn't lovable because my own dad didn't even stick around. My own dad hadn't even have come back to check on me. And every time my mum kicked off on me or kicked me out or took all of her depression out on me, my dad wasn't there to save me. No one cared. So of course this man's not going to stay. So yeah. I would poke and poke and poke and poke. And then he would leave. And then I would cry that he'd left. And then the cycle would repeat and we would argue and it would get bad. And then... Naturally, he was cheating because of the, the um, I, I don't think naturally is the right word there, but of course he was cheating because of the opportunities he had. We were very young, you know, 23, um, all of this money in this new city. And anyone that's ever lived in Newcastle will tell you it's like a, you know, a goldfish bowl. And he was getting all of this attention. He's mixed race. He's, he's gorgeous. He's got these tattoos and he's playing football. He's the new kid on the block. And... I was always made to feel like the sort of bystander of the relationship. It was no matter how much I'd achieved, 
no matter how good I looked, no matter how um, important I was as a person, I was pale in comparison to football. Mm. Football paled me. It it sh it minimized me. It minimized my feelings, my identity, um, my accomplishments, my achievements, my drives, my my goals, my drive, all of that. So I parked it. Any any of that desire that I had to be better and do more and and force some kind of like life energy back into myself. I just parked it. That's the thing I think we get we get so wrapped up in um the the relationship don't yeah. we that we forget about you know who we are our, our identity and and what our v value is to to ourselves our self-worth yeah that's one thing that I've just like really that's obviously one of the reasons why I've ended up stepping away is because I um just figuring out who I am and the growth and that I've experienced over the last five years of what what it is I want I want to like it's almost like the irrelevance in the whole relationship that I've yeah. felt and that's what I've chased I think more more than anything um but yeah just knowing that we are worth worth so much more and yeah it, just getting in tune with ourselves really and isn't it's it? not that's, that man that's made you feel like that it's it's your childhood it's yes. everything prior yeah, that, to that's him. what yeah you that's... wouldn't have even gone into that relationship if you had self-worth yeah. if you had you know secure attachment I certainly wouldn't have been attracted to someone like Dan um you know I would have maybe had a fling with him or it would have been something short-lived it wouldn't have been all of this co-parenting that we attempt but you know it wouldn't have been that and so like for you Leanne when you look back what would you if you could walk back into that house of that young woman when she, what would you say to her? What would it be that you would, what would you want her to know? Oh God. Um, oh God, what would I want her to know? That she is, she's worth more and she's, she's valued and she doesn't need to have that recognition of other people to feel that self-worth within her and because that's what I've always chased I've always chased validation. that like um yeah validation and always felt rejected and that's yeah. something that's again stems from my dad I yeah. feel like and it's always come up I've always not felt like worthy to be where I was yeah like you said just existing in that space yeah same for me and you didn't really um go as far as me in, in terms of self-sabotage but I wish I could just say to, it's okay to leave it's okay if this doesn't work out yeah you are not responsible for making this last you are not responsible for this I always had this it's thing everyone else around you though as well isn't it yeah. the environment you're in because of everybody's judgment about yeah. you and your lifestyle and and you know like for so much for long we had I had so many people well you've got nothing to worry about because you've got you were the footballer and you've got money and you've got this and you've got that and you know it's it's so people know nothing about the, anyone's individual situation yeah. to the, at the end of the day they like to judge you and sp speak about you and, and tell you about your life but they know nothing about what's really going on behind behind the scenes well I'd um like I said Leanne I didn't plan to have Sky and I was moaning it was it was a summer pregnancy and even that, I knew he's going to be out. It's going to be June. He's going to be in Vegas. He's going to be away. I'm going to be pregnant, left on my own. So even the panic of that. So it was like um, January time. I was in my early stages of pregnancy. And I went to have my, you know, you have your 17-week test, don't you, for like Down syndrome and uh, spina bifida and all of that. And they'd said to me, you've got high levels of AFP in your blood, AFP hormone. There's a chance your baby could have spina bifida. So... The saddest thing about that, when I look back, Leanne, is that I didn't think, oh my God, my baby's going to be disabled. I thought, if I don't have this baby, will he still love me? If there's something wrong with this baby, will he still love me? And how sad is that? And that was when I really developed an attachment to Sky as a baby. I didn't know she was a girl at this point. And I felt this defensiveness of like, oh my God, my baby's not well, there's something wrong here. So when I went for further scans, because we were at um, 
a hospital in Hexham. So we went to Newcastle, uh, I think it was General at the time. And they did the tests and they said everything's fine. They said that she, the AFP hormone was coming through her belly button. So the umbilical cord just hadn't attached. So um, I'd had hyperemesis in pregnancy, so I couldn't keep anything down. I was severely, severely ill. And again, that was another benefit. You know, I didn't have to work throughout that. He did take care of me. And um, I always do feel like, you know, that was that's a huge privilege to not have to work when you're pregnant. Mm. I was grateful for that. But I was severely, severely ill. I was hospitalised twice. And... When, so when I gave birth to her, she had this hole in her stomach. It needed to be stitched up. And I had her at 32 weeks. He was on the pre-season tour in America. I was all alone in Newcastle. My mum had to drive up. And I was in hospital with her for about five months before she was sort of grown enough to leave. He was going out. He was still cheating. He was still living his life. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a young guy. What do you want me to do? You know, I'm a young woman. I've just given birth. I can't even look after myself. They offered me a blood transfusion because I'd lost that much blood and I couldn't because it would have meant me being on the other side of the hospital from intensive care. I had to sit and watch her across the room then because she had a, the ventilator was through her voice box. So she, you couldn't hear her crying, but she used to, she would make the, the movements and I, I couldn't because her, when they stitched up her belly, she'd lost the peristalsis in her bowel. So she couldn't um, consume milk. She, we had to wait for it. We had to give her little drops of breast milk. So I sat there, um, severely underweight. No one really could be around me because we were in intensive care. And I remember my sister saying, my mum saying to my sister, I'm still up here with Stephanie, you know, I'm uh, making sure she's eating okay and I'm going back and doing bits of washing. I didn't leave the hospital again. He was still training at this point. He got about two or three days off. Um, and my older sister was like, what she got to be upset for she's got all the money in the world and it was like wow my child is severely sick in hospital you know and luckily that was an isolated thing she's got a little scar on her belly and she's fine she's 10 now and sometimes I look and I think how did I get through that I had no support from him absolutely no awareness of what was taking place I was still getting messages on Facebook and Twitter and I don't think it was Instagram at the time from girls saying that they'd slept with him in Marbella and done this and done that so I don't even know how I dealt with it. So you've you, you've ended up separating from from him yes. eventually, and then were you actually you were doing you were still doing psychotherapy where you was? Have you so that's something you've gone back into after um, the separation? So I'd done law, yeah. And what happened was I actually went and had therapy. So right. I oh, so you did you did you did your law degree and then you everyone blamed say. him oh he cheated or oh, he's a bad person he says no he was just activated by his trauma repeating yeah. cycles so was I I wanted to not feel crazy anymore I wanted to understand why I'd stayed I'd done really weird things like you know instead of packing my bags and leaving when he was on holiday I'd change his flights so that he couldn't get home or, and things or you know once he didn't want to spend the day with me so I trapped him in a cul-de-sac with his mate like I, I was doing crazy things like yeah. because I was desperate for some level of control had no control in the relationship didn't feel attractive didn't feel good enough constantly trying to make him love me because if and it's called um trauma reenactment so if I could make him stay and make him love me then that meant that because my dad left what the reason my dad left wasn't because of me this is what our body does it puts us in similar scenarios to keep repeating it until we fix the situation so trauma reenactment I was doing that with Dan and then I got sick of it. Do you know what? One day I just said, I'm done. And he begged for me back. He offered couples counselling. But I wanted to understand why I'd stayed and why I'd gone into that and why I'd missed the red flags. And I started to look into the father wound. And then I thought, do you know what? Why not just go back to university? So I did a conversion course for ethics. Um, then I did a coaching diploma. And then I went to Leeds Uni, did psychotherapy and family counselling. And I had so many people in my DMs like, I want to work with you. How did you leave? How many women actually leave a footballer? Not very many. They were like, how have you done it? Because I left with nothing. Sleeping on a mattress, had 38 pence in my bank, went back to work and, you know, I did it. But I'd, I'd come from that anyway. It mm. wasn't, I hadn't lost anything. I was just, I was just existing in his space at this point. So I even asked him for the money for um, my degree. Of course, he said, no, you want to do it. You're doing it by yourself, um, which I did. I did it because I always make things happen, but it's having that conviction. So releasing that control over my, over me um, 
not that he was a controlling person, but the relationship and the football world controlled me and how I put myself forward and, and how much of a voice I had. When I started to acknowledge that I had a voice and giving seven-year-old Steph a voice and 13-year-old Steph a voice and, and acknowledging that pain, I started to really look around at other controlling forces in my life and I thought, why the hell am I allowing people to tell me that I've got to pay this and pay that? So, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything, I wrote to... Um, council and said where is my council tax been spent because I've not been out of the house and I've not been in the parks and I've not been driving around and I've not called the police and I've not done this this and this and they offered me an 800 pound refund just like that just like that they put it straight back into my bank so I thought right okay let's see how far I can take this let's see what where I can take this and then I said can you please uh let me know where else it's been spent and that's when I did the direct debit um refund I've just been looking into this actually I'm yeah. so scared because bailiffs are scary yeah they are. this is the thing um, so many people say well have you done it has anyone got the money back and has anyone actually been successful and you know and the fear of obviously the bailiffs coming around and and the, that again the authority of being in school answering to authority and that's where it comes yeah. from isn't it oh my god it's, so it, they did come around yeah so they sent um so they sent a few letters at first because I did it for my sister as well so what we did is we put our new addresses as each other so they were sending letters to her. She was saying, I'm not Stephanie. And I was saying, well, I'm not Hayley. So we played a little bit of um, cat and mouse with them for a bit. And then they sent someone. And if everyone looks on, um, Bristol and Suter have it, Marston's have it. Um, a lot of people will say, well, if you're so empowered, then you will you'll stand up for your rights. You'll go outside and, and you'll cut the chain off. I'm not that type of person. I would rather just manipulate them back, you know. So they have a vulnerability section on their... Um, I hope no bailiffs are listening to this, but <laughs> on there. So if you ha- are a single, vulnerable single children, mom, and yeah, um, victim of domestic violence, if you have mental health issues, they by law have to put you through to their welfare team and give you a 13 week respite. You keep extending the 13 weeks. You can do it that way, or you can literally just go outside and put a clamp on their car. Um, I had one from, was it Bristow and Suter? Um, they actually clamped my next door neighbor's car. So I'm out the window going, please, Mr. Bailiff, don't clamp my car. No, and it wasn't my car. And he's like, I mean it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I was like, please. I said, I'm not Stephanie Ward. I'm, you know, I don't go by that name. That's the name that the government gave to me. Show me your ID, show me your ID. So I was like, look, I've got to dry my hair. My hair was wet, I just got out of the shower. I said, banging on the doors. Um, and I just, I said, look, please don't clamp my car. I'm clamping it, I'm doing it, he posts it through, it wasn't my car. Which what happens is if they clamp another person's car, they can't clamp, clamp mine anyway because it's um, leased, but they can't clamp rental cars, leased cars, because they're not classed as your property. Um, but it then makes the case toxic. So they couldn't come back after that. Once they'd done that, the case had gone toxic. That's what right. they call it. So, um, Or if they overcharge you by even as much as 2%, if the bailiff charges over, it's because they're only allowed to charge you uh, 0.5% I think it is but it made the case toxic so he had to go away I've got a guy called Jay he's incredible he's he's been doing this work for years so if anyone want, want, wants that contact they can have that he um he sent all the paperwork off for me to them not heard a thing and then British Gas oh that was a tough one it was because I'm like are we going to be cold this winter but they came to um fit a smart meter on the house because um, I said, I asked them, how do you measure gas? How much gas do you know I've used? Because you don't live with me, you know, and how much electricity, like who allowed you to harness that energy and put pipes in my house? I bought this house with the pipes already in it. So you essentially gifted me the pipes and you want me to pay for it now and I'm not going to do that. So they couldn't answer me. Every time I spoke to a customer, I would say, let me speak to a manager, let me speak to someone else. But Even, I remember speaking to Halifax Bank and the woman said to me, something about council tax. I said, why do you pay council tax? And she said, it's just one of those things, you just have to. (laughs) And I was, "Mm." I just thought, you know, look what I'm dealing with. So That's what my mum says though. Just have to, it's just something that you do, you know. So um, that level of consciousness that you have to do the work though, because when those bailiffs turn up, oh, it starts to get sweaty palms. It doesn't feel nice, but... British Gas um, sort of let themselves in my garden. They had a a locksmith and they couldn't prove that I was Stephanie Ward so they couldn't fit the smart meter. But I do have a contact anyway for anyone when they do fit the smart meter to have it removed. It's £200 and they'll just connect your main supply back up. Um, What else do I not pay? 
I'm looking to do a refund on my credit card in the next couple of weeks. I've just filed a refund on, I had an ultimate reward account with Halifax and I was paying £17 a month for insurance. But what they didn't tell me was some of those insurances I didn't qualify for. So um, I wrote that to Halifax. So I'm looking to get about four or five grand back on that. You need to um, speak too properly about it again. I've, 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 I'm in the process of doing a few bits, but um, yeah, like you say, it's just it's just it's knowing scary. it, and you do have to do put the work in, like you say, and educate yourself. And it's like unlearning like the the conditioning of like oh, it's just something you of do. authority. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I grew up with exactly. my mom hiding and and being terrified and. You know, she's she's passed on. Financial trauma is a thing. Yeah. I would definitely read, you know, um, Get Rich, Lucky Bitch, um, Jen Sincero, uh, Badass at Making Money, I think it's called. And then The Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It will really explain to you how much of financial trauma that you actually carry within your body. And this sense of autonomy, like you, you have autonomy. There is not a single... If you are releasing trauma to do with partners, romantic partners and par- parental trauma, you have to, like, you have to release the same you know, have the same attitude and release the same trauma from these big companies and these big people who have essentially, like even now the cost of living has gone up. Why? Why? Who decided that? So, mm. you know, if you're releasing trauma, you have to work on that as well. You have Definitely. to look at who is really controlling you in your life yeah. because we are free human beings and the work is there for everyone to do. Reparenting, childhood trauma, shadow work. It's all that. You don't even need to have therapy. You can have self-therapy, obviously people need someone to talk to but if you need to release your trauma you have to go out there and do it and you know once it becomes a movement I'm in that group I think you're in it Stacey's World Rocks Mm -hmm. I think they've got something like a million pound refunds now yeah I know Halifax is a nightmare you have to go into the branch Lloyd's are giving out refunds um there's loads of other banks but mortgages and car finance, everyone, you know, it's direct debit guarantee. Yeah, there's a lot of people, organisations now doing it, isn't it? And uh, definitely it's uh, do the work and get the results. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to have oh, to, to come to a novel love. I really want to keep on talking. About I know. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. Oh, you're um, so it's welcome. It's been such a pleasure. It's nice sure. being here. I just wish we had longer because there's just so much. I know. I know. So Didn't much. even touch on any of your stuff. I know. But we will. We'll have another one, won't we? Definitely. Thanks for having me. Thank you.